Hi, everybody. My name is Greg Katz, and welcome to a special defensive spring practice edition of We Are SC's Inside the Trojans Huddle. Today, we break down position by position the defense heading into spring ball. Friends, Inside the Trojans Huddle is a game like panel discussion with We Are SC columnists and staff writers. We start with the pregame show where we introduce our panel members for this special defensive edition of Inside Trojans Huddle, and we give you the latest USC Trojans football news. First, let's meet this week's panelists. Mark Culkin, we are SC columnist who writes the Monday Morass, Yay or Nay, Sunday Takeaways, in addition to regular season football and basketball practice reports. Chris Arledge, former William Jewell College defensive back and team captain, and we are SC columnist who writes the popular column Musings with Arledge. Kevin Bruce, former USC all-conference linebacker and team captain for the 1975 Trojans, also a We Are SC columnist who writes the defensively and offensively speaking after every USC game. And Greg Katz, that's me, your host and moderator of Inside the Trojan Subtle, and a weekly We Are SC columnist who writes the obvious and not so obvious and IMHO Sunday. Before we kick off our special defensive spring practice edition, here is the latest USC football news. USC officially opened spring practice on Tuesday. Spring ball will be held every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday for five weeks and conclude with a spring game on Saturday, April 23rd at noon in the Coliseum. All practices are closed to both the general public and family members of the players. There has been some notable position changes heading into spring ball. Among the changes on the defensive side, Chris Thompson Jr. is moving from safety to inside linebacker, Elijah Winston. Moving from inside linebacker to rush end, Micah Kroom is moving back to safety after making the change safety to linebacker last season. Solomon Tuyapupu is moving from inside linebacker to rush end. And offensively, Maximum Gibbs is moving back to the offensive line. And in a nod to the growing interest of USC football and Lincoln Riley, ESPN will telecast the Trojan spring game on Saturday, April 23rd. Uh, from the Coliseum, com, com, uh, commentary will be provided by Matt Berry, Kurt Hertstreet, Joey Galloway, and Molly McGrath. And as an added note, USC Spring Game will be the only spring game shown live on ESPN in 2022. USC's Pro Day is scheduled for Wednesday in Loker Stadium. It's closed to the public. For your information, Drake London will do a separate workout for NFL scouts on April 5th. And just just in, highly recruited class of 2022 offensive lineman Josh Connolly Jr., who will take his last and official visit to USC this weekend, has announced through his Twitter site he will name his college choice on April 8th. And finally, friends, we are SC's Inside the Trojans Huddle. Greatly appreciate your viewership and listenership. We appreciate and encourage those of you watching on sites like YouTube to click on the red subscriber and like buttons. Greatly appreciated, and it is free. All right, it's time for the first quarter. Time for the opening kickoff in our first quarter position question panel. Let's start our special spring, pre-spring practice defensive edition with a look at the defensive line competition. First, let's meet the 2022 spring defensive line roster. Not notable defensive line losses from 2021. Jacob Lichtenstein has gone to Miami. Ishmael Sofer and uh, Sofer, excuse me, and Mananoa Tofano are both members of the Portal Group. Uh, the 2022 spring defensive line candidates transfers: Earl Barquette uh, arriving from TCU, Tyrone Tallini from Kansas State. Returners: Dejan Benton, Nick Figueroa, Corey Foreman, Colin Mobley, Kobe Pepe, Brandon Peely, Jamar Sakona, Stanley Taufu, and uh, Tuli Tuyapulotu. All right, that out of the way. Panel, your thoughts on this position and predicted starters, please. Our leadoff man, as always, Mark Culkin. Hey, um, so just going down that list, I, I think the first thing I want to start with is uh, Jacob Lichtenstein leaving California and going back home to play at Miami. Um, it was curious to me that he was one of the first ones to, to leave considering that, you know, he actually had, he was getting a lot of playing time and he was actually one of the more productive guys when healthy and out there. So um, when I had the opportunity to, to ask around why he left, 
the culture change was necessary, and that's all I can say. And whether or not it's strictly about USC's football program or the Cali- you know, California life in general, you know, certain players might not fit out here at USC. So um, that was just something I, I kind of want to point out to you when people are wondering, well, how come that player didn't come out to USC or you know, why didn't he sign with USC or why did he leave? Those are some of the things that, are, that actually come into play. Um, some people just don't feel comfortable in California. Now, moving forward on this year, uh, who's going to start? Is Brandon Peely healthy enough uh, to man the middle? And if they go with that, you know, typical 3-4, you've got Nick Figueroa and Tuli Tuiapolotu both returning, and both are going to be starters. The real question is, is Corey Foreman ready to step in? You know, he was the number one defensive lineman, defensive player coming out of high school uh, in his class. Now, he's had some challenges. You know, he didn't get to play his senior year of high school. And last year, he seemed like he was dealing with a lot of nagging injuries. Um, Whether or not he is able to perform and make an impact, I think is going to decide how far the defensive line goes and whether or not you see a player like an Earl Barquette step in or you know you mentioned Tyrone Tulaney otherwise you know Jamar Sakona got some run last year as a freshman you mentioned Stanley um is Kobe Pepe going to be healthy from his shoulder surgery this is where it starts um and I'm really intrigued if Solo can make that transition down to Russian that to me is that's where my eyes will be focused on what I get to watch this spring all right. Uh, good point on Lichtenstein, by the way. Um, all right. Back from his uh, trip to Florence, Italy, Mr. Chris Arledge, since we're doing defense, I'm really interested in seeing what you think, because that was where you played college ball on the defensive end. So tell us your thoughts. Well, my thoughts are that this position group, like all of them, has a huge number of question marks. I mean, USC's defense was terrible last year. Terrible. Worst group that we've ever had, probably, right? So it's not like you're going to have a ton of highly productive guys returning from a defense like that. This is a spot where you have a couple of guys I think you can you can rely on. Uh, you can rely on Thule. You can rely on Nick Figueroa uh, if they stay healthy. Those are two good players that have a lot of experience and made some things happen. Uh, whether we can get something from Corey Foreman or not, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, look, He must have talent. Everybody in the country wanted him. And he was apparently a dominant high school player. I didn't see the flash from him last year. When Drake Jackson was a freshman, he sort of jumped off the, he sort of jumped off the screen a little bit in terms of his athleticism. I didn't think Corey Foreman did. I don't know what to make of the guy. I mean, I I don't get to watch practices. Uh, he didn't play much in the game. Well, he started to play some uh, second half of the season, but it's not like he stood out. And, and this is on a defense that couldn't do anything. So I don't know what to make of that. You have a bunch of guys that are question marks. You have an Auburn transfer on the edge who didn't do much at Auburn. He's, got a, he's probably an athletic guy. He's good size. You've got the guy from TCU, Barquette. And he didn't do much at TCU. You've got a bunch of guys uh, uh, on the USC roster who haven't done anything. So I don't know. Defensive line is also a position where you'd like to have enough bodies you can transfer people in freely. There are some positions you don't do that. We'll talk about that a little bit. At least I will. Like a corner, I'm not, I'm not rotating my corners. But on defensive line, you probably want to. These are big guys. They have to pursue. They're going to get tired. Uh, it's nice to have extra bodies. And unlike corner or center or quarterback, defensive line is a position where if a guy screws up, it's usually a first down, not a disaster. So um, it would be nice to have a lot of bodies, uh, guys that can play. I don't think USC is going to have a lot of bodies, uh, uh, guys that can play. Um, you have some other guys. This Devin T- uh, Tompkins, who's, uh, who's a freshman, apparently a really athletic kid, good size. He didn't do anything in high school. I mean, I know he didn't play much football, but I, I looked him up. He, he had nine tackles and three catches his senior year in high school. I mean, that's not... I had a lot of friends who had nine tackles and three catches their senior year in high school who I thought were terrible football players. I, that's not, I mean, he's never done anything at any level. So what do you make of all this? Man, I don't know. 
I think the defense is likely to be better. And if Thule and Figueroa stay healthy, you at least have two guys that can make plays. But I don't know, man. There are a lot of question marks. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Now let's let's transition over to the captain of the Trojans in 1975, a starter on the 74 national champions. If anybody knows defense, I know, I know Kevin Bruce knows it. Uh, Kevin, don't mince words now. Let's, we're starting off, of course, we're starting off first with the defensive line. So uh, if you want to give a general defensive <coughs> outlook, that's fine. But uh, specifically, let's, let's stay on task here with the defensive line and uh, your honest, brutal evaluation. So uh, have at it, buddy. All right. Um, this is a total rebuild, total rebuild. We'll, we'll put out our opinion and thoughts and, you know, there'll be as good as any other opinions and thoughts right now, including the coaching staff, frankly, to some extent. Um, it's not a train wreck. It just needs to be rebuilt. So you got to build a new uh, defense uh, up front. And there's some talent. There's more questions by far than there are answers, right? We got a few, you know, guys that have shown that they know how to play football and, and can get the job done are willing to take on uh, certain key positions and techniques, right, um, uh, on the defensive line. And that's uh, Thule and uh, Nick Figueroa. Everybody else is a question. Everybody. And if if we lose some injury uh, issues with some of our key guys, um, we're, we're uh, other people are going to have to step up. So that's the whole drill here. When you're building up a, a new defense, uh, that is other guy people are going to play that just you're not used to. I'm not used to seeing. I'm not used to pronouncing their names for crying out loud, and if they step up, do the job, have some fun, play some football, chase people down, tackle them, do it with some aggressiveness and have some fun. I'm all in, you know, I just like to see some of that attitude change uh, on the defense, which as Chris pointed out is that was the worst USC football decent defense ever since 1880, whatever the heck it was, 88, I think it was. And that probably was a better defense. Uh, it was awful. It was an embarrassment. Frankly, the team was an embarrassment. You know, frankly, you have to call it kind of the way it is. So now we have an opportunity to uh, get things right. And um, Coach Grinch, the uh, uh, approach is a 3-4. You know, when you say 3-4, that can mean a lot of things, right? His 3-4 uh, uses edge rush. Uh, kind of an overhang, hanging, you know, edge rusher uh, position, uh, typically on the wide side. Uh, if wide and, and strong side are the same, definitely he's going to use that position as a, a, a position of, of, uh, of pressure, right? And we've got some guys that we were told were pressure guys, but, I, you know, other than Nick Figueroa I, I, and Thule, who was in a wrong, who was wrongly positioned as an edge rusher. And it was probably one of the best edge, edge rushers we had. Go figure that one out. Um, other than he's a good football player and he just seems to be a good kid, young man. So um, look, picking out starters out of this group is like, I just, I'm picking out survivors, uh, frankly, that can go out there and play some football. Um, and I think the coaching staff is, frankly, I think they have pretty much the same opinion. There'll be plenty, there'll be 15 chances to prove yourself during spring ball. And out of that will come a, a, a narrowed down group of, of players uh, on the defensive line and, other, and all the other position groups as well, but the defensive line that uh, uh, they'll have. Importantly, you know, it'll be a two and three deep uh, approach. And I think, you know, to Greg, your point earlier, you're right. I mean, look, big guys get tired, they run around, they do stuff. You got to be able to rotate guys in and out, and you got to have impact players uh, that are two and three deep. And uh, you know, we'll just see. There's look, there's a lot of questions, and and right now there's not answers for those questions. Some of these transfer guys may not appear to be uh, 
blue chippers out of the their uh, schools that the, they were at TCU, you know, Shane Lee. Well, we'll get to Shane Lee, but uh, Alabama and uh, on, the, on the linebacker side, which we'll get to down the road here a bit, and, and, and uh, Kansas State, K State. Um, look, those are good programs. They play with some intensity. I'm hopeful. We'll see. Don't know. You know, you look at the film, you kind of go, well, okay. This is, this is, these are who we got right now. And I'll tell you if there's any other uh, I, NLI money laying around that's available, we need some guys out of the portal that can really, you know, hammer the, the uh, defensive line. The, uh, the down, it's a down three, but it's really, it's, it's four, four linemen, really, for the most part, is what they're playing. Some of the bigger questions we'll get to, which is in the secondary, which, you know, I don't want to spoil the uh, suspense here. But that's a total rebuild, too. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll wrap it up uh, quickly. I think the biggest question mark on uh, the defensive line uh, goes back to what some of you said. I, I don't quite know what to make of Corey Foreman. Uh, I don't know whether he was out of position, uh, whether he was mentally out of position, uh, but he is a big key on whether they can take a step forward. If I was to name starters uh, and I had to go today and everybody's healthy, my down three and a three, four would be Tui, Tui Pelotu, uh, Brandon Peely and Nick Figueroa. And that's only if we were going today, but it's because that's uh, answering the question I had. So. Let's move on to the second quarter inside linebackers competition panel. We start the second quarter with a look at the inside linebackers on the 2022 spring uh, roster. Notable linebacker losses from 2021. Can I Maga gone to the NFL? Uh, transfer, of course, Shane Lee from Alabama returners. Uh, Raylan Goforth, uh, Taylor Katoa, Tavisi Namura, uh, Julian Simon, and uh, a player that has been moved, uh, Chris Thompson Jr., who was moved inside linebacker from safety. Panel, your thoughts on the position and pre predicted starter or starters. Uh, we'll uh, start off with uh, Kevin again. Linebacker is your uh, cup of tea here since you played it and were quite uh, proficient at it. So your thoughts? Yeah, um, gosh, this is going to be Pete and repeat, but we don't we don't know a lot uh, on linebacks. And frankly, the transfers uh, look actually like they can play football, um, which is you know also, that's helpful. Um, I would say, and this is a real close call, but I would say the worst position group in last year's defense was the linebacker group. Uh, overall, it was quite a battle on which one was worse, but that I think they edged out some of the other groups um, because they screwed up not only the run game, but also the passing game. So well, I'll, I'll give them the nod. And, you know, obviously I have, a, you know, kind of standards in my mind, which um, when you look at something, you kind of go, yeah, that's not how you're going to win a football game playing like that. Um, the uh, I'm not as concerned, and this is, I think, actually a fairly important point uh, about the uh, change in the uh, uh, defensive scheme. Uh, I don't think that's going to be as, as big a, a deal, uh, uh, certainly among the defensive linemen, but among the linebackers as well. I think it's a, a question of, you know, they have certain reads and then they have uh, responsibilities based on those reads and off they go. So it's a question of who can get there. A guy like Shane Lee from Alabama, uh, he had He's had a good season, just wasn't, you know, within the last couple of years. Um, and he's got an opportunity to, to, you know, get it right for himself. Uh, I believe he was also, he was injured. I think he had a knee injury. It's coming off that. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully that's sealed up and he's, and he's kind of raring to go. He's one of those taller <clears throat> inside linebackers, which uh, from, uh, you know, a, uh, a practical perspective is not a bad thing. It's just a question of, you know, in performance within the run game, if you're, if you're standing up to blockers, then it's going to be a long day. You got to be able to, you know, use your, uh, your pad height correctly and hands and all that kind of stuff. That's technique that's teachable. So we'll see. Um, 
So we're going to rely a lot on transfers within this group uh, and others that we don't even know. We haven't seen enough play time, playing time to make, you know, uh, predictions as to their, their capability. They, some have come in with, you know, four stars. I, I, I think we may even have a five star in there, but even not, doesn't matter. You know, they're highly regarded, highly sought after and have highly not done much. Some of it is they didn't get a chance to play, which was always a mind boggler to me. This like last year, last season, I should say. Uh, the uh, you know when I played some of these young men that you know didn't get a lot of playing time before playing them, we, what are we hurting for crying out loud? You know, um, so we have more to prove in spring ball with some of these guys. If some one or two of these um, uh, youngsters can can stand step up and uh, play the position. I'm thinking more predominantly the inside linebacker uh, role, uh, Mike and Will, uh, then, okay. I mean, that, that'll, that'll work. And it's hand in glove with the defensive lineman, which is why the, the units kind of work out together a lot because they need to be able to know what, everybody needs to know the right assignment against certain kinds of position. Uh, uh, alignments and, and related. So that's where some of that learning comes into play, which isn't necessarily scheme related, but it is knowing what your uh, compadre, uh, you know, next to you has got maybe a gap responsibility and, uh, you know, certain techniques, it, it, you know, does he know that or do you got to tell him, you know, and if you got to tell him, then learn how to tell him so that nobody else knows that you're telling him what to go do. Like, hey, you know, you, you got to take it, you know, down position to the A gap. Okay. Um, so, so those are the kinds of things that it'll, it'll be fleshed out during spring ball. Uh, I'm a little long on this one because either there's no big standout linebackers here. Not a one. Not a one. So, so are you, do you have you a build one for the two starters in a three, four on the inside? Uh, I'd say Shane Lee will start if he doesn't get hurt. And the other one's up for grabs. Yeah, total, total jump ball. Sorry about the mixed right. metaphor, but you guys get it. All right. Happy face, Mark Culkin. Is it up for grabs? How do you see it? Oh, it's, it's definitely up for grabs. Um, one name that hasn't been mentioned, and maybe because the uh, it wasn't put on the list, is Rajon Davis. Uh, um, good point. I have a feeling he's going to be one of the stronger candidates to play inside linebacker uh, next to Shane Lee, who I, I think Shane's strength is going to be run support. Um, he's more of a, he's more of a throwback, you know, middle linebacker, you know, kind of more stout, compact, gonna, you know, just when he hits you, you feel it because he's kind of just a, a brick. Um, where Ray Jean is more of the athletic type of inside linebacker, more rangy, um, I, I think has better lateral movement. Um, so those would be my two inside guys. But yeah, to, to what Kevin was, was talking about, you know, the linebacking group as a whole last year was just, they were lost. Um, so this, you know, besides the defensive line, um, a couple other candidates to look at. You know, I, I think Julian Simon was another guy who, you know, him and Rajon Davis, they were able to play last year, but for whatever reason, they didn't get the opportunity. Um, you know, and Raylan Goforth returns, but, you know, God bless him. He just had, a, he had a really rough year last year. And I, I don't know. He, he was lost in space. Honestly. Yeah, it was. I felt, I felt badly for the, for the young man. And, and that's why I said, God bless him. Yeah, he just, yeah. like you said, he just looked like, a blind person in a dark room trying to find a ball carrier. And, you know, it, it was, it was hard to watch. So again, you got Raylan, um, Julian Simon, you mentioned, you know, uh, to a CV Nomura comes back mm -hmm. inside linebacker. I'm going to go with Shane Lee and Ray John Davis and Julian Simon is probably the top three guys. And then, uh, you know, knowing that there's going to be some more transfer portal movement before, during, and after spring, um, I, I think we'll probably see maybe another one or two guys come here before fall camp starts. Because, yeah, there's not a lot of depth there. 
And I, I don't know how creative you can get, even with the guys that, that you know, they kind of have slotted it outside and rush in, you know, do you, are you going to move solo back from rush in to middle linebacker when he's been focusing on playing rush in since pretty much the end of last year? That's where he was on scout team. So, yeah, a lot of question marks. And I'll let Chris take over the next question because I'm going with uh, Rajon and Shane Lee to start inside. All right, Chris, you're you're up. Yeah, I don't know if any of these guys can play. Uh, I, Shane Lee's going to start. He's going to start for a few reasons. One is that he's he's played a lot of football. Uh, he seems to be a, a, a leader and a guy who's going to hold the other guys in the position group accountable, a guy who's uh, a guy who's acting like a professional, who's working hard. And that means something, right? Especially when you have so many young guys that you're hoping can play to have somebody who's going to, I'm assuming, understand the defense because he's played for a long time and in a system where he was very well coached to have a guy like that uh, is, is helpful. He's going to start. I don't know if he can play. He played well as a freshman. He was a big time recruit. He's done very little since then. He wouldn't be here if things were going well at Alabama. So, um, so he's going to be the starter. I don't know what that means. Uh, at the other spot, if I had to guess, I would guess like Mark, that it's probably Ray John Davis. Can he play? I don't know. He didn't beat out. He didn't beat out go forth last year. Now that may not be his fault. He was a true freshman. And he was playing on a very poorly coached team. So I don't know what to make of that. But I know that Goforth was starting and, and made very, very few plays all year. I mean, we, we can speak frankly, right? If Goforth can play, he hasn't shown it yet. Um, but Davis and Simon didn't beat him out. Uh, can those guys play? Man, I have no idea. I don't know if Solomon T is ever going to actually play a football game, but if he does, I'm a little bit surprised it's at the edge because they're moving him away from um, the position that was supposed to be his natural position. And it happens to be a position where we don't have a single proven guy, right? There's no Thule here, right? There's nobody. There's nobody to look at and say, yeah. I know we can count on this guy. There's not a single guy at this position group that you can say, I know we can count on him, not one. And Solo is going to go to edge rusher. Okay. But that's weird. A little bit. Um, maybe they just decided he can't play the spot. Um, I don't know. You have Garrison Madden, who is um, a super athletic guy. Uh, but he's going to be a true freshman. He's going to be undersized. He hasn't played very much football. He will win the sprint competition in this group. In fact, he's going to win the sprint competition against most of USC's corners because he ran 10-7-1 <laughs> in high school. And that is fly. <laughs> Can he play? I mean, I don't know that I would want to rely upon a true freshman linebacker who's a little bit undersized at 200 pounds and who hasn't played much football. I think he didn't play football until his junior year. So am I excited about that? No. I don't know what to tell you, man. This is a, this is a group that is full of question mark after question mark after question mark. And unlike the other position groups where you can at least point to a guy or two and say, I feel good about him. I don't know that there's anybody here you can say you feel good about. There's only one guy that I even think is competent, uh, and it's based on film and, you know, whatever, and that's Shane Lee. And some of that is, look, there's a question on, on his knee. Uh, and, you know, to Chris's point, you know, look, uh, he's leaving a very stout program in Alabama to come to, to USC. So he's, he's looking at some upside, but, you know, they're, they're always, you know, breeds the question, well, wait a minute, why are you leaving a championship program to go to a maybe sort of kind of championship program in a year or two, right? So, you know, that said, I think he plays. I think he starts. How good he's going to be, I don't know. How long will he last? I don't know. Uh, I, I, actually, I think he is more of a lateral type linebacker, but his lateral uh, capabilities are more – from end to end, not so much from sideline to sideline. Okay. So, yeah. I was just looking at his measure rolls. And no, 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 no. Actually, your, your point was well taken. He, okay. But his, his pass coverage uh, in a zone look, is, is, it actually was pretty good from what I could tell. You know, there's not a lot of data on any of these guys. Um, but look, we're all kind of saying the same thing. We don't, 
flip and know who's going to step up and play. And yeah, there might be a couple breakthrough uh, kinds of situations. Wouldn't that be great for a change? And it can happen. It pushed hard enough and work hard enough and some good things happen. And okay, you know, all right, we're going to need some of that. And some of these guys that have been four stars that have underachieved for whatever reasons, including not their own, as Chris pointed out already, um, we're going to need some of these guys to like, make it happen. You know, um, I like Chris's point about the, the young man that can run 10, seven, which is like blazing fast. Right. The, the problem at linebacker is you're being held by a 295 pound guy. So I don't know how blazing fast you're going to be with that hanging on your back. So oops. I think that's one of the, I think that's probably why they might've moved solo up to the rush edge because you know, he, the history that he had with that foot injury um, he has one goal in mind, go get the quarterback and what, without having to worry about other guys crashing left and right from him as from the linebacker position. I, I think it, it will actually utilize his, his DNA, which is go hurt somebody in a straight line as quickly well, as you can get there. Honest to goodness, someone better damn stop the run. Honestly, we, we, we got to do it. We, we, you know, screw all this. You know, I want to blow up the quarterback. I want to do this. Yeah, all, all great, all good. You know, so and so has got a DNA for this or that. That may be true at one time, frankly. Uh, Corey Fortman is a great example of a guy that I don't know. This is unimportant that I don't know what he was trying to do last year. What's important is he didn't know what he was trying to do last year. That is important, and that's coaching. I don't put that on the young man. That's crappy teaching, and it's sinful, frankly, in my view. All right. Well, I'm going to say, uh, Chris, did you want to add something? Nope. Okay. Uh, <laughs> write that down, Mark. Chris does not want to say. Chris something. is in such uh, a good mood from his vacation. We are getting the best of him today. You know, you're. That's absolutely correct. The best. I think we need a show. The best of Chris Arledge. I think that would be a wonderful. I, I don't think our. I don't think our viewers are going to feel that way. I, I think they're going to feel that. <laughs> I think they're going to feel I've had better performances. I need to turn it up a notch, but not when it comes to the inside linebackers. Guy, I have nothing to say. Yeah, what are you? What are you? What are you going to say? This like, oh wow, that was insightful. You know, we don't know what the hell is going to do anything. You know. Well, what I'll say is this: is that I I have a lot of respect for Shane Lee coming out of high school. He's one of the top, if not arguably the top linebacker in the country. If it was Clay Helton and his group that were running the show here. And Shane Lee came over, I'd say, I don't know what that means, but I think because it means he's going to get screwed up. That's what that means. You can, sorry to interrupt, but you, that, no, no problem. Uh, we won't even throw a flag on that one for a personal <laughs> foul, but it, means, it uh, probably means you should let him call the defensive plays. Is probably what it means. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that Shane Lee, the fact that he was wanted by Lincoln Riley and his group is a good sign. Uh, I agree with all of you. I don't need to repeat what all of you said. I do think that it's Raylan go forth for me and Shane Lee inside. And I think we do have to look at the point for whatever reason at the moment uh, that go forth was considered by the old regime. Take it for what it's worth as the better options of what they had. Now that may not be true, but uh, until go forth is removed from that spot, I'm going to go as of today. Now, as far as, uh, Gerald Madden goes, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure we concentrate on guys who are available for the spring. Uh, it's okay to touch on what they will do when they come in the fall, but um, uh, it's Lee and go forth for me. So on that note, it's halftime and we're going to go uh, to the outside linebackers. Uh, again, those of you that are tuning in, uh, we're, we're going over the spring uh, defensive uh, views position by position. Uh, let's take a look at the outside linebacker spring roster, which I'm not quite even sure, to be honest with you, what is an outside linebacker in this particular situation uh, of, uh, you know, is it a traditional three, four edge rusher, what have you, but we'll just go with what we think we know outside linebacker losses from 2021, Drake Jackson to the NFL, Hunter Eccles transferred to Arizona, Raymond Scott transferred to Fresno State, Giuliano Filonico. Uh, he's a portal guy. 2022 spring outside linebacker candidates transfer Romello Height from Auburn. Returners, this is interesting to me. Elijah Winston has been moved 
from inside linebacker, and Solomon Tuyalupu has been moved from uh, inside linebacker. Again, I don't know exactly what outside linebacker is supposed to look like. Uh, I rely on the expertise of our defensive guys here. Uh, so starting with that, Chris, what do you see? I mean, I see a lot of guys who have never done anything. I mean, I'd like to say more than that. I'd like to say that I watched Auburn and I thought that uh, Romello was an amazing player and I'm thrilled we got him, but he didn't do much at Auburn. Um, so I, I don't know what to make of it. I also suspect that USC is probably going to play a lot more 4-2-5, um, right? I think we're going to see a lot more nickelback than we are uh, than we are seven front seven guys, especially in the Pac-12 where teams want to spread you out and throw the ball all the time. So I don't know how much... <coughs> I don't know how much this position group is going to play, but again, I don't have anything to add because I don't want to bore everybody. Um, there's not a single guy who's ever done anything. Some of those names are guys who, who, you know, at one time were, were considered guys who could really play. I mean, Solomon T we were excited. when We signed this guy. This guy was linebacker of the year in high school. He was a superstar. Does he have anything left? Who knows? And we're not going to know either, right, until September because we're not going to be able to – unless – I mean, maybe he'll stretch really well and we'll be able to, we'll be able to see that. <laughs> you know, we'll say that. That's Solomon T. That guy's a good stretcher. He's a, he's a future yogi. Maybe we'll say that. But, uh, you know, we don't know. Nobody knows. Lincoln Riley doesn't know what he has with Solomon T. How can he? Until they put on the pads and go out and play, until you see whether the guy can stay healthy, you don't know. So this is another position group where we have absolutely nothing proven. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, and to, to your point, so the fans and listeners and the viewers know when Chris is referring to stretching, the media is only allowed to watch stretching uh, and individual drills uh, at each spring practice. Um, then they're ushered out uh, for two and a half hours of do what you got to do, but don't be around here when you do it. Uh, and then come back for uh, interviews uh, afterwards. So uh, point well taken, I think. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's ask Kevin, uh, your thoughts on outside linebacker position, or is there even an outside linebacker position? Or are both guys rush ends? I don't even know. No, there is. There, there's a position. It, it's not an every down type uh, position, which actually is a little, uh, makes it more difficult tell you the truth, uh, more, makes it more difficult to play because it's so situational. Um, unless it's a, a simple read, react, uh, you know, edge pressure, you know, or contain type role, unless if it's not as simple as that and you have a both a run and pass responsibility, then you're playing a real linebacker position. Then Chris is right. They're in, they're in a soul in here that frankly knows anything about what I just said, um, said with all respect. Um, they've not demonstrated it. So um, the coaching staff has some work to do here. And uh, I can say that about every position group on defense. I think I already have. Sorry if I'm being boring. Um, I'll let Chris uh, spool things up a little bit. But, um, you know, uh, I have a little bit of, of – upside wishing for uh, Romello uh, height from Auburn. He's got the, uh, the, the body type, the lengthy body type that would uh, uh, give us a little bit of a, uh, an advantage if, if the guy can really play uh, you know, a linebacker role. Um, don't, haven't seen enough to tell you that, um, and nor, nor has anybody else, including the coaching staff. But the fact that they pulled him out of the portal and, and thought he could, you know, play football at USC, then there's got to be something there that, that they see and know. And uh, each one of these potential uh, players already has a book ready to go that each position coach and coordinator has available that has to, that certain things and certain techniques have to be taught to each of these players. And if they do that, they're going to have a chance to play and be successful, they're gonna have to trust the teaching that they get and they're gonna have to execute against it uh, with, with um, energy, enthusiasm and hostile intent. You do that even when you screw up 
you know, it'll be uh, okay. Uh, you know, it's not the end of the world. Playing lackadaisical, I'm not sure where the hell I am in football, which is what we got certainly last season. And frankly, I tell you, we had a lot more of that over the last several years. Um, doesn't get the job done. So, and that's not what Lincoln Raleigh is going to allow, guarantee. I watch a lot of the film of the uh, Grinch's defenses at OU. And uh, actually, it's not a simple, straight up uh, three, four scheme. There's a lot more going on there, which I was encouraged about. Yeah, there's some sophistication. Uh, it brings a lot of the secondary play into it. We can talk about that later. But anyway, with respect to the outside linebacker role, look, there's maybe a couple guys that might play. Depends on what, frankly, ultimately, but situationally, what Grinch wants to do with that with that situational role, right? Uh, I don't think it's in every down uh, position. All right, Mark. Uh... So, so, Kevin, let me ask you, is it just uh, impossible to name starters uh, as from your viewpoint? Yeah, I, uh, from my perspective, it is, because I'm not sure we're going to have a role to have a starter, uh, you know, frankly. Edge rusher is probably one that you're going to see more of than outside linebacker. Mark, and then you, it, and ahead, I'm sorry, one ahead. last one, one last okay. thing. If we, sure. if we take one more natural edge rusher with speed and such – it like a Drake Jackson and have them drop into pass coverage. I, I really am going to hurt myself. Okay. I'll, I will, I will need intervention. I just telling you right now. That's the perfect segue, Kevin, because I, I think what we're ultimately asking right now is who are we replacing Drake Jackson with? Cause that's who was place, playing outside linebacker last year. And he was playing out of position. So right. um, you don't replace Jake, Jack, Drake Jackson, uh, you know, He's going to be going to the NFL. He's going to be making a lot of money here in a, in a few weeks. So what do you have left to choose from? And again, you know, the, the, the common narrative and theme has been, we don't know. Um, we don't. So, you know, they brought Romello Hayton, you know, to be a, an outside guy. Uh, he, you know, he's long, he's rangy, uh, he's athletic. Maybe he can be that guy who can drop into a zone coverage uh, at outside linebacker. Um, do they take somebody whose strength isn't playing inside and say, you know what, your strength is outside and move them back out there? What would make life really simple and, you know, is adjusting your defense to the personnel you have available instead of trying, instead of trying to fit a, 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 a round peg into a square, use what you got build around that because last year was just oh we've got this pca let's move it over here and drake jackson didn't belong over here when he belonged over here so i'm with you kevin i'm not gonna you know i'm not gonna suicide myself but um it's they're gonna have to figure out with what they have what works rather than trying to slot these guys into a, a position especially the front seven that we'll, we'll call it I got nothing else to add with the linebacker and linebacking group. All right. Well, I'm going to go uh, strictly a shot in the dark here at some level. I'm going to go with Romello height because I think they brought him in. They've seen him before. They uh, have been on the recruiting uh, radar uh, at one point. And I really don't like doing this, but then I don't know what to do with him. Uh, Corey Foreman. I, I don't want him to see him, see, see him used like Drake Jackson. I thought, that was just a horrendous display of misusing a player. But if you want to just call people a position, uh, I don't know, outside linebacker, rush and whatever, Corey Foreman seems to fit that. It's really what the job description is with him. But I'm not at all comfortable with uh, saying that he is the man. So uh, well, we know, we, Greg, we know he's not a linebacker. Right. So right. he's not going to, we're not going to fill that role. Edge rusher slash, I don't know, TBD is. is They're not okay. building his body to be a linebacker either. I don't know if you've seen any off season pictures of him, but he no. doesn't look anything like a linebacker. I, I don't know what that means, but. Um, he looks like a defensive lineman. Okay. Well, he was well, too, he was 265 last year, right? I mean, that, yeah. that's what the. He, he's, he's added a good 20 pounds. 
Okay, well, yeah, then it's safe to say he's not going to be a linebacker. Instead, he's going to be a guy who drops back into coverage and doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't wait to see it. Yeah, I, you know, there was nothing better than watching Drake Jackson drop out into the flats, have no idea what he was doing, be completely unable to play in space, not get any pressure on the quarterback because you got one guy to rush a quarterback and he's dropped back in a position where he can't cover anybody. That was that's- amazing. And that's Thule, you know, coming up to a gap. <laughs> the last player I saw do that successful at USC was Kyle Moore. That's how far back we got to go with. Wow, pulling out the old Georgia card there, huh? I just remember that interception along the sideline going. Wow, <laughs> well, Drake Jackson had uh, had a two yeah, picks, I think. Yeah. 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 So yeah. anyway, uh, that was. Yeah, I don't know what they're going to do with the Corey Foreman. So if he's been enlarged, as it were, then okay, fine, put him on the outside and see if he can play seven and nine technique we'll see all right well uh let's move on here uh reminder before we begin the second half uh again a reminder that you're watching or listening to wrsc.com's inside the trojans huddle this week's wrsc panelists include mark culkin chris arledge kevin bruce and i'm greg katz we encourage you to check out wrsc.com part of the on three network and become a subscriber to the best coverage of USC football and Trojans athletics. And as a bonus for the curious, there is currently a free WeRSC seven-day trial uh, to view our exclusive On3 Plus content, which includes analysis, breaking stories, and data for USC football, basketball, and the balance of USC athletics. All right. We begin the second half with the cornerback's spring roster notable secondary losses from 2021 chris Steele to the nfl isaac taylor stewart to the nfl Jaden williams to louisville dorian hewitt perhaps not even uh, still in the program that has not been totally confirmed greg johnson to the nfl chase williams is in the portal the 2022 spring cornerback candidates transfers makai blackman from colorado and latrell mccutcheon from oklahoma returners Prophet Brown, Dorian Hewitt, Joshua Jackson Jr., Donis Ote, Jaden Williams, Sierra Wright, and a freshman, uh, Dominique Jackson, out of, of course, modern day. But uh, he's got, he's still maybe recovering from his ACL. All right, panel, uh, your thoughts on the uh, position itself and your predicted starters. Mark, lead us off here in the second half. Mm hmm. So um, the, the two transfers are interesting because they've got starting experience from, you know, Mackie, uh, Mackie Blackman from Colorado and Latrell McCutcheon from Oklahoma. However, uh, you got some young returning talent on USC's roster also. Uh, if Joshua Jackson is healthy, uh, I think he's going to probably lock down one of those other positions. Sierra Wright is another guy who was heavily recruited and highly sought after by pretty much everybody in the country. He chose USC. Um, I'm going to throw a wild card in there. And uh, man, as much as I would hate to yank him away from the safety group, I would love to see Kalen Bullock at a cornerback position. Uh, but again, you're, you're, you're taking away a ball hawk who, who, who literally can cover that back half of that uh, of the secondary by himself but i would love to see him give a shot out uh, a shot at one of the cornerback positions there's a lot of talent here you're gonna see some attrition um i think by the end of spring camp maybe another two guys possibly hitting the portal I, we don't need to mention names but you're gonna see a couple guys leave they gotta clear some spots they need help elsewhere all right. Uh, you have a prediction there for us, Mark, on who you think the starters will be? Well, for the time being, I'm going to go Josh Jackson if he's healthy and McCutcheon. Okay. Chris, what's your year? Now, you're the guy who's the cornerback guy and uh, was uh, well, well thought of. So your perspective is highly valued. Uh, what do you see as the cornerback situation? I feel better about the corner situation than I do about some of the other position groups. We at least have some guys here that I know can play. 
Blackman from Colorado can play. Uh, he's played a lot of football. He was uh, honorable mention, all Pac-12 guy. Um, he's he's somebody you can at least rely on to make plays out there. When I say make plays, look, we, we talked about some of the other positions. <laughs> talked about in the defensive line how you like to have a lot of bodies, keep guys fresh, especially uh, especially with your pass rush. You want fresh legs coming in all the time. Uh, that's not what I want with my corners because uh, at corner a mistake is a touchdown. I want guys who are reliable. I want guys who are going to be in the right spot, who can make tackles in the open field uh, and who can, um, and who can uh, avoid getting beat deep. That's what I really want. It'd be great if you have guys who can make plays on the ball and get a couple pick sixes, but uh, that's not the most important thing. Um, Last year, USC had some (coughs) highly uh, highly recruited guys who'd played a lot of football and, uh, and played really poorly which is why I don't know what to make of all the young kids. I, I get it. I can understand why they didn't beat out a, a steal or an ITS. I get it. Those guys have been around for a long time, but because they didn't beat them out, it makes me wonder because, um, because we didn't see much from the corner position last year that I feel good about. So Blackman, I think is going to be a starter. Uh, McCutcheon didn't play a ton at OU, but he did play. The coaches know him and they brought him over. So they know exactly what he has and they wanted him. That's a good sign. I think that means he's probably going to get that that second spot. That's my guess. Uh, At least he's going to get that second spot until uh, Damani Jackson is healthy. Um, That kid has a skill set that you can't teach. You can't teach, um, you know, he's about 6'1", I think. He has long arms. He ran a 10, 200 meter you can't teach a skill set like that. When that guy's healthy, he's going to be on the field. Um, But I don't think he's going to be healthy early. So I I would guess Blackman and, and, uh, and Latrell McCutcheon are are probably your two starters until Jamani Jackson gets healthy. I agree that Joshua Jackson's a guy who can, who can play. And I, and I think he's going to, he's going to get in there a lot. Uh, I I don't think you're going to (laughs) see Bullock moved to corner. We'll talk about him in a minute. But I think that's your group. And you know what? That's not a terrible group. I feel okay about that. Um, I, think, I think we're likely to be better there than we have been in the past. And if you help those guys out by giving them a little bit of a pass rush, which may or may not happen, uh, you, might, you might find that you're okay at that position. So I don't feel bad about that group at all. All right. El Capitan. By the way, for those of you that are viewing this uh... On YouTube, Kevin has a background. It looks like uh, I know that you're in on the tackle, Kevin, but is that against Ohio State? It is. Uh, Ohio State Rose Bowl 1975, still the largest Rose Bowl crowd and probably will be for the foreseeable future since they've taken out so many seats. So, yeah, that was uh, just quick, and I'll move on. I'm going to talk about myself. But the um, that play was the first uh, offensive play from scrimmage by Ohio State. And they triple team me, which was fantastic for the other guys, because if they think they need to triple team me, we've got a whole bunch of guys better than me and that are wide open, ready to kill them. And we had a, we played good defense uh, that day. And uh, anyway, so that, that play there was a uh, triple team, the linebacker, which I had to be a mistake on somebody's part or somebody's plural part. All right. Well, tell us what you think about the cornerback situation. All the guys that are gone, I'm glad. I hope they do well in their next adventures, whatever those things might be, but adios. Horrible last year. Um, and, you know, what can I say? Other than what I have said, they were, they were horrible. Do you, um, see, do you see any candidates that uh, catch your eye? More horrible than the others? Or, or, Kevin, no, do you guys feel comfortable with Dante Spring? Do you feel comfortable, Kevin, with Dante solely focused on cornerbacks this year and not having to be focused on everything? Yeah, you know, that's actually a really darn good question because I was really disappointed with his uh, slotting in as the you know, interim head coach. He wasn't ready for that. It showed, you know, clock man, every, every way possible it showed up. Okay, fine. I'm not going to slam the guy for that. But what I am going to say is the secondary got worse, not better, and it was bad to start with. And the cornerbacks in particular, which were his, that was his position, I think, for the most part. Really, I thought he did get some help later on on that one. Um, we're just awful. Awful. 
I mean, no, no run support. Uh, you know, pass coverage was uh, like, I don't know. Guys were clueless. They, they couldn't play situational football. And then you combine that with um, the safety positions, which we'll get to later, uh, other than um, uh, Caleb. We were, we, were, <laughs> we were in trouble, and it showed. Anyway, that said, I see this group, and like Chris was pointing out, actually, there's some, there's some guys that can play football here. And that is encouraging. And, uh, you know, the kid from um, Oklahoma was, was – that, that's not an accidental recruitment situation that was planned for. And so I expect big things from McCutcheon. Blackman from Colorado. I, w- I watched film on this, on this kid. He can play. He can ball. And, and, and that'll work. Now, to Chris's point about uh, Jackson, you know, coming from modern day, look, freshman cornerbacks should terrify a head coach. They do things that are great, and then they do things that just, you know, drive you nuts. He's got enough speed and, and uh, range, physical range, that he can, uh, assuming the knee injury is fully recovered, which is a big if, by the way, at that age. Um, he, he can make some things happen. As far as, and again, to Chris's point, as far as picks and so forth, look, I'm not looking for pick six out of this group. Pick six things to come out of your – your nickel back and your safeties. That's where your pick six is likely happen more than anywhere else. Less so with cornerbacks. We need guys that can take the coverage assignment and execute against it. And by that, I mean, look, if you've got to stop the inside uh, move of, of uh, you know, the, the wide out, just take away what you're told to take away. Take away the inside move, the slants. If you're told to take away a fade route, you take away the damn fade route. You don't play hero and they're taking away nothing. And then we got a safety back there who's, I don't know what they're looking at. He's looking at anyway, one in particular. Uh, so I'm encouraged with what I see here. I really am. Of all the position groups, I think this is the one where I said, all right, look, uh, as bad as we were last year in this group, I'm glad the practitioners of last season's cornerback play are gone. And I mean that since, as sincerely as I said it. I've said it three times. I think I made, made my point. I overcooked it a little bit. Uh, and I'm glad that these uh, – we've got some talent here. We've got some football players that know how to play corner. And there's there's potential for some depth. So I'm encouraged with that. As far as starters, uh, I, Blackman and McCutcheon is what I would go with, just to name a couple names. All right. Well – uh, it seems like we're getting to a real consensus here. I too believe that uh, Makai Blackman and Latrell McCutcheon, at least uh, on the outset here uh, for spring ball, are going to be the starters. Uh, I think that they have the experience, as you have all mentioned, and I think they have the uh, you know, skill set. Uh, although there are some players, uh, I think this is a talented group. Uh, I'm not thinking that, you know, that uh, Damani Jackson is going to be a major factor. I think he will be down the line. Uh, but I think that, you know, we, there are, there are some people I'm intrigued by Sierra Wright. I am intrigued by Prophet Brown. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, there's some, there's some stuff to work there. I think the subject of, uh, uh Dante Williams is one that we have to consider down the line. Uh, we have to see how, uh, you know, Alex Grinch wants uh, his defensive backs to play. So uh, it will be something to monitor as the season goes on. So on that note, we begin the fourth quarter of Inside the Trojan Huddle with the symbolic lighting of our version of the Coliseum torch. This is always a, a favorite here. There we are. There's our little torch for those of you that are actually uh, – have you done some? Have you done some polling to see that this is actually a, a favorite uh, in the program? You know, I'm glad that you brought that up because yes, there are a lot of people that think this, as corny as it is, they actually like it. There's something about it that uh, is very USC like. Thank you for bringing that up. That was very, uh, very insightful. I like just, to see. I like, I like to see the data on that. On, on, yeah. on, fire, on firing up stubby. Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to lob some softballs up to you, Greg, and let you and let you talk about how much people love it. I, I just don't know. 
I haven't had anybody approach me on the street and say, hey, you know what I really love? I love that candle. But then again, I haven't had a lot of people approach me on the street saying they love the program. So <laughs> I don't know. Well, I can tell you one thing. I, Based on what I'm seeing on the numbers for the program, we're doing pretty good. And we appreciate everybody who watches and listenership. And, uh, you know, we'll keep bringing it and trying to tell was there, was there a huge jump? Or was there a huge jump in viewership when you brought the candle out? Hey, it's not the size of the wave, Chris. It's that motion of the ocean. (laughs) (laughs) That 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 candle is a grower, not a shower. Well, okay. (laughs) Look, um, (laughs) Greg, I'm sorry we're even talking about the candle. I'm a little bit sorry we do the candle. I'm more sorry that I brought it up. We should have just passed through it. I should have kept my mouth shut. (laughs) Well, excuse me. Did you get that on paper? Chris should have kept his mouth shut. He Is didn't that, mean it. He didn't really mean it. Don't worry about it. No, he did. He, you know, Kevin Bruce that he didn't mean it. No, I know. We all know he didn't mean it. No. And, and and we don't want. And that's him why we that. love him. That's, that's why we love him. I didn't mean it. Okay, I didn't mean it. I shouldn't have said. Right. <laughs> he likes. He likes. He likes stubby the candle. It's all right. It's cool. Yes, he does. Yeah, no, no question about that. All right. Uh, again, uh, let's take a look at the uh, safety position here. Notable safety losses from 2021. Uh, Chase Williams transferred to Louisville. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody transferred in as a safety. The returners, Xavier Alford, Britton Allen, Anthony Beavers, uh, Kellen uh, Bullock, uh, Examarion Gordon, Jalen Smith, Chase Williams, Max Williams, and uh, Mika Kroom, or Micah Kroom, uh, has been moved from linebacker into the safety position. So. Panel, your thoughts on the safety position and predicted starters. So, Kevin, we'll begin with you. Well, I can't tell you how glad I'm. Uh, I, when I see the list of names, it doesn't include uh, Alamalo. I, I hate to be that brutal about it, but, you know, he was good for at least one over-the-top touchdown in half of the games we played. I would say there was probably five or six of those, and it was just – it hurt to watch. Honestly, it did, you know, in situations where, you know, the, the need for uh, over the top uh, coverage was obvious and probably was told to him and he just didn't get it. So that made it doubly difficult for uh, Caleb to, you know, play either free or strong. And they played both positions, by the way. So, and we have, we play both free and strong. It's just the distinction between the two is uh, pr- pretty you know, uh, minimal. Yeah, it's not. It's it's specialized. So I wouldn't call it. It's not exactly minimal, but it, it is a specialized difference. And one one is a run, principally a run stopper, and then a help the cornerback over the top role. The other one is a help the cornerback with the m- most uh, skilled wideout. Uh, or, or several white, white outs. And in the case of some teams, the tight end going deep with down seam patterns, helping that uh, coverage out. So anyway, that's, those are the differences of the, of the skill sets uh, up, up for the safeties. Um, I love the way Caleb plays. He plays good football. Uh, he's savvy, he's in a good position. Um, forces a lot of inside out uh, plays and good run support. Uh, he put some hits on some people that they're probably still talking about. He may not remember them, unfortunately, but he, he did he did a pretty darn fine job. So, as you can tell, uh, of the secondary, he clearly was my favorite guy. Uh, not even close um, in terms of, of players in the secondary for sure. Tuli's probably my would be right there as well. Those two guys, they can they can ball, and they're and the, the you know. I wish we had more of them, but okay, we take what we got. Uh, with respect to others, uh, it's really going to depend, you know, a fair amount on uh, what uh, the defensive uh, f- um, scheme is going to demand. Grinch runs uh, the quote the, the, the three the three four, but oftentimes that includes a nickelback, but it also includes uh, two deep safety. They're playing halves. Uh, typically, it's called. You know, too deep safety, some deeper than others. It's situational. It depends on a, a lot of different factors. But if they're in the proper alignment, it's going to be call it too deep, right? 
uh, to TWOD. So um, with that with that said, I think we've got a really good practitioner in, uh, in Caleb. So as far as a backup uh, to that, there's, there's a lot of skill uh, pushing against that, which actually is pretty encouraging, I have to tell you. Um, a lot of it's going to kind of a, a address itself uh, during spring ball, uh, especially when those that can combine both uh, pass coverage, knowledge of, of formation and situations, and run support. It, I will tell you, it's probably one of the more uh, difficult positions to play because you're you're spooled up for pass coverage first, but that ends up being a run play, then you are totally committed to run. And whereas a linebacker is committed to run, other than, and look, if it's third and, you know, 20, I mean, I'm like, come on, you know, okay, we're going to play something a little different. Linebackers should be run first, pass second, pass coverage second. So as a typical rule, I think that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Safeties, not so. Very different, different positions. So they got a lot of, there's a lot of cerebral stuff going on there, and but it has to happen very quickly. And some guys just have it, and some and and learn and get better, and some really struggle with it. It's a tough position to teach. And the nickelback is, is basically the same thing. It's a safety position that uh, maybe sometimes close to the line of scrimmage, sometimes not. It's, it's, it sort of depends on, on who you're up against. And uh, uh, I just look at the nickel as another safety. Hi, right, Mark, your thoughts on the safeties position? Yeah, I'm, I feel really comfortable back there. Um, I, I think in, in combination with the cornerback group, that's going to give a little bit of confidence to, to Grinch and to Riley that, you know what, we can maybe gamble a bit more up front knowing we've got some solid guys behind us that can that maybe cover up some of those weaknesses. Um, you know, Kalen Bullock, we know can, can take away the deep part of the field and half the field if, it, if he's, you know, cheating, so to speak. Um, everyone's in agreement. We've got enough guys at cornerback that if one guy isn't playing well, someone back behind him can back him up. So for me, the safety position, um, I love watching Max Williams play nickel. The guy plays it with a linebacker mentality. Jalen Smith is another young guy who, you know, is not afraid to stick his nose in there. Um, I'd like to see, I'm not so sure about his pass coverage skills. Um, I saw him get lost a little bit last year when he was out there, but I, I think nickel is, they're solid um, between Max and between him. And then, you know, you've got guys like Anthony Beavers, uh, Zamarian Gordon, uh, Xavier Alford, you know, in the box, that in the box safety, the strong safety, you know, however we want to categorize it, um, they felt good enough there that they took Chris Thompson and moved him into the linebacker role. So, uh, I, I think between the safeties and the cornerbacks, they're going to cover up a lot of the weaknesses that we have at linebacker and defensive line initially. So, uh, my starters, let's go uh, Alfred in the box. Uh, Max Williams at nickel, and obviously Kalen at free safety. All right. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, Chris, this is your expertise. You're in the secondary. How do you see it? I agree with Mark's starters. Um, we talked about it uh, quite a bit already. Kalen Bullock is a fantastic football player. He's only going to get better. Um, two, point, two additional points I would make. Number one is that we have a lot of corners that we think can play. Um, those guys can play safety, especially now. Uh, it used to be where you'd have a free safety sort of rangy guy, pass coverage, and then you'd have a thumper, a Cam Chancellor type. That's sort of been taken away. The rules have kind of taken that away so that these safeties, especially when you have these four, uh, four wide sets, these guys are supposed to cover and supposed to cover in man. You can move a corner back there. I think they have enough athletic bodies they'll be able to do it. Um, so I feel pretty good about this group. Yeah. All right. Uh, I will uh, wrap this uh, fourth quarter up. I think that they have a lot to uh, pick from. Uh, a lot of it could come down to who the nickelback is. But if I'm just picking two right now, Kalen Bullock for sure, uh, coming along in the footsteps of all the great mirror 
high school, Pasadena high school, uh, your football players have come to USC and there's been many. And I'm going to take a shot in the dark and I'll say Max Williams will be one of the starters uh, right now. I, I kind of like the way he plays and where he goes. So uh, with that in mind, uh, that's who I would pick. All right. We're in overtime. It's going to be a brief overtime. Viewer questions and answers. Uh, a reminder to all those of you that are listening or watching, if you'd like to submit a question to our panel that we can answer on Inside the Trojan Subtle, just go to the Gary P or we are SC members message board. From there, you'll see the topic thread regarding questions for Inside the Huddle. Here are uh, two questions we're going to have in our abbreviated segment. This one is from uh, Philippe, originally from East LA, Roosevelt High School, 1966, I guess. That's the 66. The Rough Riders, of course, Roosevelt High School provided USC with their first Heisman Trophy winner in Mike Garrett. Says, hi. Do you think today's football players are proud to be Trojans or do they have what's in it for me attitude? Now I'm going to just kind of normally then rather than just jump in, uh, I'm going to, well, is Kevin with us? I don't know what happened there, but that's okay. He put himself on mute. Put him on mute. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's go. We'll start, start off with Chris. Chris, what do you think? Do football players have the same USC attitude that uh, uh, we were accustomed to during the successful years? Look, I think it's human nature that some people are, are some people are more selfish and some people are more willing to be team players. I don't think that's changed over the last 30 or 40 years. The incentives may have changed a little bit in some respects. Um, but I, I don't think we know what the current crop of USC players is going to be like. USC has had a broken culture for some years now. And where you, have, where you have a broken culture, where guys don't work the way they're supposed to work, where they don't prepare the way they're supposed to prepare, where guys um, make selfish and stupid plays and they don't get punished for it, um, where the culture falls apart, then, uh, then you would expect that you would have a lot of guys who may be capable of being team players uh, play like something else. Yeah. And so... Um, one of the one of the fundamental things that has to happen is that Lincoln Riley has to fix the culture. I suspect he will. I know that that's uh, that that's one of his primary goals. Uh, we'll know more when the season starts. But uh, <coughs> if he does that, then that means that by definition, we're going to have guys who are going to work hard, who are going to do their jobs, who are going to help their teammates, uh, and who are going to represent the university well on and off the field. Um, if he doesn't do that, then we'll continue to see what we've seen, which is uh, a group of guys that where you have some guys who, because they're self-motivated, will work hard and play hard. Um, but, um, uh, but where you take the proper incentive structure away, it's human nature that people don't put in the effort that they have to put in. But football's a grind, right? It's hard and it takes a lot of effort and it's hard work. And if the incentives aren't right, if the culture is not right, then it shouldn't be a surprise that people aren't willing to run that extra sprint. They're not willing to, to do that extra set on the, on the squat rack, right? So it's up to Lincoln Riley to fix the problem. And he knows that, and I suspect he will. And then we won't have to talk about this anymore. <laughs> anymore. We can simply say, I I'm proud to watch these guys. They look like what a USC football team is supposed to look like. So I think that's where we're headed, and I'm looking forward to it. Mark, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I was your say, thoughts on USC football players? Are they proud to be Trojans, or do they do what's in it for me attitude? I, I was just going to piggyback off of what Chris said. When they arrive, yeah, they're proud to be Trojans. I mean, they want to be there. That they I mean, <laughs> they were recruited to go there. Some of them walked on to go there. So it's a matter of, you know, does the culture – provide these young men the opportunity to want to remain being Trojans and, and to follow those, you know, you know, the, 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 the five principles of, of what it means to be a Trojan. So spring camp is, is going to weed those guys out um, with Lincoln Riley coming in. They know these guys know what it was like in the past, the way I'm hearing it described now um, the coaches aren't friendly. 
At least they're not being described in friendly terms. Um, you know, strength and conditioning coach has been called everything but a nice guy so far. Um, so yeah, to Chris's point, they're trying to change the culture. The guys who might not be 100% Trojan anymore probably won't be here by the end of spring camp. I guess is the best way to answer that question. Well, I tell you, I think that um, depends on the time. We have new distractions. I think from having watched the team for over 60 some years, you know, the idea of coming to SC was always big. And I think for those that sign up to play for SC, but there's so much emphasis on quote, getting to the league. that it's almost like uh, SC is being treated like minor leagues. And I would say that's probably true of uh, most schools. It's just how most schools deal with it. You know, the NIL is a new thing. It's, so it's going to be a challenge there too. But I think whenever you're winning, uh, you know, people get more into it. Winning seems to solve a lot of things when you're losing. You know, it's really, it's about me. Where am I going to be? Uh, okay, we're not winning. So can I get to the NFL? And I felt that I saw that. I mean, let's face it, Drake Jackson, even before the season started last year, already said he was going to the NFL, uh, which was to me like, okay, maybe you are, but uh, I was uncomfortable with that. Mark, do you want to? I was just no. I was just like Greg. You've had multiple guys come out of high school saying, "I'm I'm taking my talents to X Y Z for the next three years." I mean, uh, that safety who barely played a down at USC and I think ended up finishing his career at U University of Texas El Paso. I mean, his name escapes me right now. But that's how arrogant uh, some of these young men are. Yeah, but keep um, in mind the guys at the guys at Alabama. They want to make they want to make the NFL just as badly as guys at USC. They want to make the money. They want to be all Americans. I mean, those guys just as much as USC players want to catch the touchdown pass. They want to have the big stats. It's the thing is, and, and you touched on this a little bit, Greg. When the program is a mess, when when guys aren't working hard, when they're not doing their jobs, when the coaches are inept, and when the coaches aren't uh, aren't demanding excellence and aren't showing excellence then of course guys are going to be focused on their NFL future. What else are they going to focus on? Winning the Pac-12? Uh, you know, being, you know, having, having a great USC experience? No. I mean, the, the fact is that the culture was broken because the coaching staff broke it. And once that happens, all that you have left is, well, let me see if I can salvage this and make the league. So it's up to Lincoln Riley to show these guys that <laughs> – that being at USC is worthwhile, not just as a step to the league, but as something else. I mean, this is a legendary program where so many greats have played, where you can win, you can, you can play in Rose Bowls, you can win national titles. You can do all this stuff that you guys have dreamed about. And these guys have dreamed about it. Now, even these guys that say they're gonna spend three years somewhere and go to the NFL, they still want to have legendary college careers. They do. The problem is that if you have, if you have an inept coach, and an inept culture, then you're going to have you're going to have a disaster. But it's not like those guys don't want to be all Americans in college. They do, they do, they want to be great. I'm I'm just wondering if the larger question is, you know, do do people, in a general sense, do young men not just at USC but across the country, love football the way they did 15, 20 years ago? Because I think I think that's where the question really is. You know, are these guys not so much trojans but you know why are they playing football you touched on it chris at the very beginning it's a grind and they're still going to class and they still have girlfriends and or boyfriends um whatever there's a lot going on between the ages of 18 and 23 <coughs> that doesn't involve football well look the, the truth is that at every program you're going to have guys that love football and then you're going to have guys who happen to have been born in a football player's body and that's not such a terrible thing right i mean you see it all the time you have these guys who are who are superstar players and they say yeah i don't even really watch football i'm not that interested in it they just happen to have been born 6'3 250 running a 4'6 we'll take those guys as long as they're putting in the effort right as long as they're motivated right. we'll take guys like that in fact i'd rather have a guy like that than have a guy like me who, uh, who had relatively little talent, but loved football. I mean, loved it, right? I'd rather have, I mean, if you can give me both, I'll take both, but, but you have to be able to run and hit. And, 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 and so <coughs> I, 
I think, I think the premise of the question is, is there something wrong with the modern athlete or mo modern USC football players? And, and I would say no. Human nature doesn't change. Um, for a very long time, if you're put in a situation where selflessness pays off, where there's some benefit to it, then people are willing to be selfless. And if you put them in a situation where there's no real benefit to being a team player and you, and you might as well look out for yourself, then that's what the vast majority of people will do. That's always been the case, and it's the case now. These kids want to be successful. They have to have somebody there who can help them be successful. And if they have that, they're going to put in the effort. And the guys that don't want to put in the effort, and at every program there are guys that don't want to, will be shown the door. That's the way a good program is run. And, and so I think I, I, I'm fine with the modern USC player. I think what, what I'm not fine with is a modern USC coach up until I hope right now. And so I think we're going to see some changes. I'll wrap this uh, question up because we need to wrap this up. But uh, I think uh, if you look at what happens to teams that go to bowl games, how uh, some of the stars, uh, and this goes back to winning, having a goal. A lot of the stars say, I'm not playing in a bowl game. I mean, Christian McCaffrey did it at, at Stanford. The game wasn't meaningful enough to risk an NFL career. And that kind of just is the evolution of where we're at. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll stay with that one there. Uh, Kevin's making his way back here. Uh, we'll just uh, want to make sure that he gets a, a chance. Kevin, are you able to uh, answer the question that we had going? Kevin's getting his earpiece back in, I think. Uh, can you hear us? We're, we're, we're getting a range now. Can you, are you unmuting? Unmute. Unmuted, yeah, we've got tornado warnings and sirens going off. So I'm going to be joining Toto here in a little bit. Okay. All right. Just briefly here on this question we've been banding about, are the football players of uh, today at UC, USC, uh, do they have more of a me attitude than they did uh, years ago or maybe from the Pete Carroll era? How do you see it? You know, probably – a lot savvier group, a lot more sophisticated with respect to social media impact on uh, their own, uh, uh, how to influence their uh, perception in the uh, overall uh, marketplace. Now I use that term very purposefully. It is a market. Um, ultimately, somebody's gonna have to play football and deliver the goods. I don't care how many, you know, likes and whatever other elements that I have. I know nothing I'm talking about in that respect. Uh, people have, it doesn't matter unless you can like get the job done. So a guy like Caleb Williams is going to get paid a lot of money now, let alone future, um, because he has demonstrated, he has a track record of demonstrating, you know, extraordinary skill on the field. So the me part, really is, uh, it's an okay thing, honestly, but the me has to become a team. And boy, that's a challenge. Not impossible. Alabama seems to get away with it. I don't know, I don't know what they're doing, you know, hanging guys upside down or whatever, but they're, they get teams out of some really good players, really highly skilled, highly sought after. And uh, that's not a bad model to follow. And I would, I suspect Lincoln Riley is also very skilled at that as well. And I think Lincoln Riley also uh, is going to get a lot better at what he does, which is if that doesn't scare the rest of the Pac-12, uh, it should because he's a good coach. I think he's going to be a great coach. All right. Well, we're going to wrap this up with a very, very quick uh, question from fourth seed. Can somebody explain the seven on seven games who plays, what positions participate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, who wants to answer that question for fourth seed? All right. So it is exactly what it is. It's seven on seven. You have a quarterback, you have a couple of receivers, you have a tight end, you have a run in and running backs. Um, the ball literally is, is snapped from a stool. Somebody kind of just flips the ball to the quarterback 
You start count. You have referees who will count one alligator, two alligator, three alligator. You've got to get rid of the ball in X amount of time. You're looking for first downs and touchdowns. That's the premise. It's a skill driven position to develop chemistry and timing in passing routes. There's not a whole lot to it. Chris, you yeah, want to add no. to that? No, this is, look, this has been a staple of football for a long time. It, it, it recently seven on seven tournaments have become a big deal, but for, for decades, seven on seven was a staple of, of many football practices. And as a mm -hmm. former defensive back, uh, we, we spent a lot of time doing it. Interestingly enough, Lincoln Riley is not a believer in seven on seven and has made that very clear. And for good reason, the passing game is completely different where you don't have somebody in the quarterback's face, right? You're not really, you're <coughs> teams should be able to throw the ball all over the yard when the quarterback can't possibly be hit when he, when he always has a lane to see through because he doesn't have hands up in his face. I mean, so it's, it's something that's, that's been going on for a very long time in practices before you had the tournaments. I don't think USC is going to do a lot of it. And, and I think Lincoln Riley's right not to. I think it's yeah, an interesting I, point. I, I, I can tell you that in my experiences, we also, to Chris's point, use a seven on seven drill. <laughs> it, it was our least, um, it was our shortest drill period on, uh, on you know, past coverage day. Yeah. Because it, 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 it isn't, it doesn't give anybody a good look. The, be the benefit you get one-on-one -on -one matchups with cornerbacks and wide receivers uh, a safety trying to cover the middle. And that's really it. it Look, it's great. Really it's great for the secondary. Yes. It's great for the secondary because as a secondary player, it's, <coughs> you're in the worst possible position, right? The quarterback doesn't have anybody in his face. He doesn't have to worry about being hit. He can see everything. Um, and so I think it's actually very useful for the secondary because it puts you in a terrible position, a position you don't want to be in where a quarterback has all day to throw and doesn't have to worry about it. Yeah. Um, I just not, I'm not convinced it does much for your quarterback or your, or your receivers because it is, it is completely artificial. So I don't think USC is going to use it very much. I think USC's only use of seven on seven is that's where a lot of their future recruits are, uh, are playing during the summer. They'll go check them out. That's about it. I would say in wrapping this up that um, if you watch video, I would invite 4C to watch video on uh uh, we are sc.com we provide some really outstanding video yeah, but follow scott watch, schrader yes scott schrader give him credit absolutely uh if you watch it basically let's take malachi nelson uh, five-star quarterback you're hearing so much about he basically just stands there uh no duress no nothing no passing lanes he just throws it uh i think to me i think it's beneficial the kids get to travel they get to see other parts of the country they get to see other universities they might be interested in. I think that's good. I think it's a huge recruiting benefit. And we may see that uh, coming up shortly. Uh, Brandon Ennis from uh, the South Florida Express is a big recruit for USC. And he was just out here in Los Angeles. And I think they may have sealed the deal with him. And they even had Malachi Nelson playing on his uh, seven on seven team. Uh, and, you know, when it gets right down to it, everything, and I think all you guys would agree with me, life is about relationships, and especially in recruiting. When these guys start talking and getting excited, uh, you know, I can't say that anybody from the South Florida Express would have visited USC had they not come out here for a fun, really unofficial trip. So 7-on-7 seven seven has many uh, good things about it. Uh, I wouldn't rely on it. We don't know whether a player could take a hit over the middle. Uh, the physical end, you know, aspect of football, but it does showcase the guy's uh, athletic skills. So on that note, long edition here, but I think very, very, a lot of quality. Uh, that's a wrap for this edition of Inside the Trojans Huddle. A reminder, next Tuesday, we'll go over uh, what we know of spring practice and cover topics related to USC football. Until then, big thank you to this week's panel of Mark Culkin, Chris Ar uh, Arledge, and Kevin Bruce. And a special thank you to all of you for watching or listening to Inside the Trojan Subtle. Till next Tuesday, this is your host, Greg Katz, reminding you all, fight on, everybody.